so privileged to to have be to be loved by you because it is just so perfect to be in your presence lord it's an honor for us as your children to come before you uh, and and to enter into your presence with the boldness you've provided us to say Father, thank you. Thank you for, for your love poured out for us. Thank you for your adoption of us. Thank you for, for the creation you've created. Thank you for the fact that we can live and breathe and worship and serve. Thank you, Father. Thank you that you are perfect in every way. And we are just so... So glad to call you Father, Amen. Abba, Hallelujah. in Jesus' name, Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Amen. thank you Lord. Won't you please be seated as we get ready to break bread. While you're being seated, we're just going to flight a short video. Hold the people communion cup and lift only the see-through film at the top. Hold the foil lid securely and pull the see-through lid back carefully to get to the wafer. Then pull back the foil lid to retrieve the juice. <laughs> As we break bread this morning, it's... Uh, it's really our Lord's table that we gather around. So if you're visiting us today, uh, welcome. It's good to have you with us. For those of you who are online, you've got time to just gather the, uh, some bread and some wine and some juice very quickly. We're going to break bread uh, together now. Uh, and no matter who you are, join us this morning. Because it's really good... Uh, to celebrate what Jesus did for us as we break bread together. This morning I want to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'm going to start off with verse 28, which says, Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink of the cup. And so we're going to take a few seconds just to be silent, where we say, God, please forgive me for what I've done when you know that there's something that you've done wrong. There's somebody who you ought to forgive. You need to go to them afterwards and ask them for forgiveness. But just ask God to forgive you for that which you did, which you shouldn't do. And also for that which you didn't do that you know you should have done. And then reading from verse 23, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
So if you could take the wafer from your cup, and we all eat it together as a symbol of our unity. And in the same way he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So let's drink the, the blood together. Thank you, Father, that we could celebrate your goodness to us as we share in the bread and the wine in Jesus' name. Amen. Now if you turn your attention to the screens, we'll watch the notices. Things are happening, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Aren't it? Yeah. You can stand here where they can see you, don't hide there. <laughs> Today is a brilliant day in the history of this church. And you will find out why. Aaron came on staff on the 1st of October, 1997. Yeah, some of you weren't born yet. And he served for 20 years on the staff, and then he had to step down in 2017 from pastoring to honor the family. And he did this by helping them with a the farm in Kwakwa, near Lesotho in the Free State. And today, after nearly four years, he returns to pick up where he left off. So, he's back on staff, and he is back on staff as an executive member which increases our strength a little bit. Nah. 
Now, sometime in the future, when he's preaching or something like that, he will tell you some of the stories of how God drew him back. Um, God and me and others. Um, but I'm a very happy person today. Um, because those of you who have known Arendt, you've known him to be a blessing to you. And those of you who don't know him yet, you will find him to be a blessing. So welcome back. Uh, sorry, Mr. President, I broke the rules. And uh, yes, thank you, thank you, Orant. We'll give him a chance to say a lot of words later, but you know, there's a dangerous thing when you give Arnold a microphone. <laughs> well, the second great thing that's happening with us is today we announced that Alan Baird is coming back to help us with the healing ministry. Yeah. Just for history's sake, Alan was on staff for four years during 2009 to 2012. And he started our healing rooms. And he actually ran the healing ministry during that time. Um, Gavin took over from him, so he'd laid the foundation. Now the reason Alan left us, it wasn't because he was upset with us. <laughs> He moved to Bella Bella for family reasons, I'm going to call it that. Uh, Vera, his late wife, was bedridden and eventually died from the debilitating disease of multiple sclerosis. We watched this man nurse her for years and years. Now, he's married Angelique and he now is the happy father of two I'm going to call them late teenagers because they are getting towards the 20s and they're sitting there by the door and um, we're very happy that he's married again he's very happy that he's married again um, now Alan's going to be helping us from Bella Bella if you don't know where Bella Bella is it's warm bars and he'll be traveling here to help run retreats and teachings and training and equipping folk and he'll be setting up the ministry in a structure that's not dependent on full-time staff. That's the one thing that hasn't happened, which he is going to do. So that if the staff all die, the ministry goes on. That's very important. So we're going to watch that happen. We're still hoping that sometime in the future, because it is a big financial thing, that he'll be able to leave better, better and come to Centurion um, so that he can do more hands-on personal counseling with folk who need Jesus to set them free from all manner of stuff. So we're looking forward to that. So Alan, I want to say welcome back. We need you. Thank you. You can take your mask off so I can just see what you look like. <laughs> okay, that's what he looks like. You got him. Well, God has a way of working. You know, when we look at circumstances, we kind of wonder what is going on. But God never stops working. We sang that just now. Well, this morning we have a visiting preacher from the music group. <laughs> Uh, this is the second time Ron is preaching in the time he's been here. So I think the last time he preached was nearly four years ago. So I think this will be a better sermon. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully. And if it is a better sermon, I want to be paid double for this. <laughs> My agent will speak to you after this. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> it's good to see you all here today. Um, <clears throat> it's good to see some young people here as well today. Uh, spoke to some of them. 
told them that today's sermon has to do with food and obviously they made it. <laughs> so it's good to see you guys. Food brings people together. <laughs> anyway, so I want you to imagine for a second. Imagine that you have close to 20,000 people following you. And I'm not talking on Twitter, but they follow you, right? And they're following you because they want to hear more about what you're teaching them. And obviously, as they follow you, the place you're going to is located in an isolated place. There's no shops, nothing, no food. You're in a mountainous region. And, of course, these people sit down and um, you realize that they're waiting for you to feed them. But as you look at your supplies and what you have to feed them, you realize that you only have two fish and five loaves. What do you do? What would you do in that situation? Seems quite impossible, right? But the truth is, despite how impossible the situation may be, it did in fact happen to a man named Jesus. Mm. Yes, it did happen. So today we're going to examine the event recorded in John 6, verse 1 to 15, of how Jesus fed close to 20,000 people. And now I see some people looking at me funny, um, the Bible does say 5,000. That's true, I'm not changing the numbers. But it was only talking about the men. You have to take into consideration the women and the children. Mm. And when you add that up, you have close to 20,000 people. Right? right. Yep. So, I believe there's several things God wants us to learn about his generosity, his grace, and about Jesus being the Messiah through this event. So we're just going to examine the text and go through it. So first... In John 6, verse 5, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He was asking this only to test him. So the first thing we note, there's a test in the question. You see, when Jesus was asking the question, where shall we buy bread for these, or bread for these people to eat? There was a test behind the question, and there were two people with two different answers. Firstly, there was Philip who had a hopeless answer by stating that it would take a year's wages to have each person just have one bite. Just one bite. And then there was, of course, uh, Andrew who, in verse 6, verse 9, in John 6, verse 9, he says, Here is a boy with five loaves and two fish, but how far will they go among so many? You see, the issue here is that Philip and Andrew were relying on their human way of thinking. And because of its limitations, they could not conceive in their minds how they could solve this problem. They did not choose to believe in the power of God flowing through Jesus. Right? So the question we should be asking ourselves is, is our hope and trust in our talents, our abilities, or in God? Because Philip and Andrew were relying on their abilities but they were limited. The Gospel of Luke gives us a picture of what trusting in God looks like in reality. Let's read. There's a centurion servant whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders to, of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves you to do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But look at this, focus on this line. But just say the word, and my servant will be healed. And it goes on, and Jesus says, When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith, even in Israel. Do you see the difference here? Philip and Andrew didn't know what to do. But this example shows us that the centurion had so much faith, he told Jesus, Look, you don't even have to come see the person. Just say the word, and he will be healed. You see, God wants us to be like the centurion official who had faith in Jesus to heal his son, 
despite it going against all human possibilities. That is what the official had. See, I believe the test was to see if the disciples had faith and trust that God the Father would provide through Jesus, despite how impossible that situation was. And bear in mind that before this, Jesus changed water into wine. He healed an official son without seeing or touching the child. And he healed a man at the pool called Bethesda. So this was nothing new. Before this event, they saw Jesus do miracles. Mm -hmm. And yet they still doubted. Isn't, it, isn't that funny? Mm -hmm. Humans are funny. But, you know, this lack of trust in God is, is really nothing new. Let's take a journey to a time hundreds of years before Jesus fed the 5,000. To uh, an event written in Exodus 16, verse 16 to 20. This is what the Lord commanded. Everyone is together as much as they need. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. Then Moses said to them, No one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was very angry with them. You see, one of the reasons the Israelites kept the manna, which is bread, by the way, a form of bread, until the next day, was because they did not trust and believe that God would provide for the next day, the next week, or the years to come. Yeah. They still didn't trust Him. That's why they kept it. For insurance. You know? Yeah. Just in case. Just in case. And again, this is despite the fact that before this happened, the Israelites experienced God splitting the sea for them to pass through getting them out of Egypt, and even killing some of Pharaoh's men so that they could survive. So they too experienced signs and wonders. You know, sometimes we like to say, God, just show me a sign, and I'll believe you. It's not correct. They saw so many signs, and they still didn't believe. At the end of the day, the question Jesus asked was to test the true conditions of our hearts and our minds. You see, God wants all of us to have faith and trust in him for our lives, whether it's for, you know, difficult things or in easy situations. He wants us to trust Him. And right now, I just want to say, God is good, all and all the time, God is good. such a cliche saying, you know, we often say it without understanding it, but I thought it was very appropriate to say it right now because of what I'm about to say. God is good. You see, Scripture tells us that Jesus tested them already knowing what he was going to do. He already knew what he was going to do. In John 6 verse 6, he asked, it says, he asked this only to test him, for he already knew what he was going to do. You see, God's power of provision is not determined only by our faith. God can provide and care for us even when we doubt him. Isn't that a good God? Yep. Amen. Amen. That's a good God. In fact, I'll go on to say, if God's level of provision was only based on our level of faith in Him, we would not have much. Let's be honest. It's not that Christian, huh? <laughs> we would not have much. The next thing we learn while examining this text is that God is extremely generous. And I want to stop here a little, just for a minute. Um, I think all of us have been through this. I've been through it, you know. Eating at the table with, with family, and there's food, everyone dishes up, and there's this one haunting thing called the piece of shame. You know the last piece on the plate? Don't act like you don't know. You guys know what I'm talking about. You're eating there, and you, you know, you're wondering, should I take it, but people are looking at me. And what's so funny is the person who often takes that piece never looks you in the eye and always has a comment. <laughs> you know? Hey, Auntie, this chicken is good, eh? <laughs> you know? <laughs> the piece of shame. The piece of shame. <laughs> well, look, the thing is with God, there is no piece of shame. He's generous and gracious, right? 
in, in, in John 6, verse 11 to 14, it says, Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with pieces of barley loaves and, you know, went on, put it in a Tupperware and left. <laughs> so from having five loaves and two fish to having more than enough to eat for over 20,000 people, that is serious. God is generous. And not just enough, more than enough. Look, we see God doing the same thing hundreds of years before in Exodus 16, verse 23 to 24. He said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left over until morning. What the Lord was doing there, he provided enough resources for the people to bake as much as they wanted to and keep as much as they wanted to. God is generous. He's generous. He gives to us more than we need. And in fact, off, of the, off the top of my head, I think of King Solomon. You guys know the story of King Solomon? God came to him in a dream and asked him, what do you want? He asked for wisdom, correct? What did God do afterwards? Did he only give him wisdom? Yeah. Gave him wealth. A kingdom, a very huge kingdom, gave him more than what he was expecting. That's God's nature. Yep. The third thing we learn about God while examining this text is that God knows how best to meet our needs. In fact, I'm going to say that God knows that we have needs. And he even knows the needs that we don't know we need. Did you get that? Yeah. Yeah. Should I say it again? I'll say it again. God knows that we have needs. And he even knows the needs that we don't know we need. I'll explain. In John 14 to 15, verse 14 to 15, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, multiplying the food, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they, intended him to, that they intended to come make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Now, this is puzzling because I asked myself, why would God withdraw? Why would Jesus withdraw if they want to make him king? We get the answer later. See, the people wanted to force Jesus to be king because they wanted him to be the leader who would liberate them from the political oppression they were facing at the time. That's what they wanted. But Jesus withdrew because he knew that God sent him to provide for the people's true needs that they even didn't know they needed. So now the question is, what were the people's true needs? What do we really need? In fact, what does the world really need? We find a hint to the answer in John 6 verse 40. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall, he ha shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. You see, people, my people, we all need eternal life. So God wants us to have eternal life, but how is He going to provide that? And this is where the significance of Passover comes in. I like to say that this is where the ultimate provision meets the ultimate need. In John's Gospel, there's so much detail about the Passover, and he's constantly you know, referencing Passover. And it's clear that he's trying to pull our attention to the events that happened during the Passover. But the question is, why? You see, the Passover was a historical time when God saved the Israelites, and got them out of Egypt, out of the bondage in Egypt, into the promised land. That's what happened. And, of course, in the wilderness he provided man and bread, right? Mm -hmm. Now what John is doing is contrasting that event 
to the events that were happening during the feeding of the 5,000. It was close to Passover, and this is why. You see, in Exodus, Jesus provided manna in the wilderness. There was the blood of the lamb as a sacrifice that they would put on the doorpost, right? Mm -hmm. And, of course, he freed them from the bondage in Egypt. But now, in this event, what's happening is this. Jesus provided bread for the people in the wilderness again. Mm -hmm. Through his death, he's the final sacrifice. So there's no more sacrifice needed. And he died on the cross so that he could not only free Israel, but he could free the whole world from the bondage and slavery to sin. Do you see the difference? The people of Israel wanted a politi political liberator, but God knew that we all needed a savior. He knew the whole world needed a savior. That's why he withdrew. Jesus is the ultimate provision for our ultimate need, eternal life. Not money, not a car, those are secondary things. Jesus is the ultimate provision from God for our ultimate need. Amen. I know some people might think, well, Ron, that's, that's, that's good, that's, that's good stuff, but um, that's in the Bible, that's in the Bible. So I want to share a quick story with all of you. Um, <clears throat> I was 13 years old, and um, I was living not too far from the church at the time, five minutes away, and I lived with my grand, my grandmother. Um, I was doing my last year of primary school at Littleton Primary. And so every day I would have to take a taxi to get to school. And so I remember clearly this one day, I'm out there waiting for my taxi, short sleeve shirt and shorts, relaxing, and all of a sudden, there was rain, a heavy storm, all of a sudden. And I was standing there, and automatically, I started having a conversation with God, and I asked him, I said, God, why do I have to go through this? I mean, look at the other kids, they, they're going to school with their parents in the car, you know, relaxed. Why do I have to go through this? And I remember saying this close to shedding a tear. I say close to shedding a tear because real men don't cry. <laughs> but I wasn't a man then, so I did shed a tear, just saying, just saying. So I was close to crying. Well, I was crying. I'll leave that one for you to figure out. Um, <laughs> and as I said that, as, as I was crying, I remember not even 10 seconds later, a white car stopping at the side of the road and I can remember you know the window coming down and I remember the gentle smile of a beautiful looking lady who wanted to give me a lift to school and in that moment I remember feeling and knowing that God was answering me and saying my son I can provide I'm your father I can provide and still Maybe some of you might be thinking, well, Ron, that's just an act of kindness. You know, there's rain, you were a kid, someone just wants to give you a lift. But there's a part of the story I didn't tell you yet. Firstly, this lady lived five minutes away from where I lived. Her kids went to the exact same school, and she offered to take me to school for the rest of the year. That is no coincidence. That is God's provision. That is God's provision. So God still provides today. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He doesn't change. He's Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. That is who He is. We're just singing the song, Waymaker, right? Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper. That is who you are. Those are not just words. That is who God is. So, today we have learned a few important things. Firstly, God tests our faith in Him. He will test us. God tests our faith in Him. Secondly, we've learned that God is a very generous and gracious God. 
when he provides, he'll give to you more than what you expect from him. Thirdly, God knows how to meet our needs better than we do. Trust him. I mean, he even knows the needs you don't know you need. Yeah. <laughs> Lastly, but most importantly, we've learned that Jesus is the ultimate provision for our greatest need. So, if you've never accepted Jesus as the primary solution to your problem or to your greatest need, today's the opportunity to do so. If you have found yourself doubting God as provider and taking things into your own hands, only to find that things are getting worse, today's the time to change that. Today's the time. Not tomorrow, today. And if you have any need and don't know where else to go, then I'm telling you, you're in the right place because God can make a way. And so if any of these three questions apply to you, we're going to have a time of prayer. We're first going to sing a song, but after that song, I want you to make a conscious decision. Remember, God wants faith, right? And prayer is a statement of faith. So come for prayer if you need it. Don't go home, come for prayer, and we're going to have some people here ready to pray for you. Let's pray. Father, you are Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. You are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. You never change, Father. You are a good, good Father, and you love us. You provide for each and every one of us. You give to us generously and graciously. And so, Father, we just want to thank you that you are giving, Father. And we want to apologize for sometimes not trusting you, for not having faith that you'll come through, for trying to think, take things into our own hands at times. So, Lord, I pray that today you may show us in our lives as we go forth that you are our provider, our primary provider, Lord, and that we'll have nothing without you. Thank you for your love, Jesus. Thank you for your life. Amen.
pray if you need prayer. Otherwise, have a great Sunday, everybody.